Uh, it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you, and at this point, I always love speaking in the afternoon because everyone just ate and your parasympathetic nervous system just kicked in, and so all the blood's gone from your brains and muscles right to your intestines to digest your food. So either you're going to have a fantastic nap or hopefully learn something. So either way, we come out ahead. Um, so what I'd like to do is to talk about uh, some of the work that I've been doing uh, in, um, in Ghana. Um, I started... A, a few years back, right, actually, I started right after I finished um, my undergraduate, uh, my PhD, and I was on the, the medical school route, and I thought the only way to do international work is you had to go to med school, and my, tr my career path took a different turn um, just right out of uh, university, and I decided to go into academia, and I thought, well, it's too bad, that door's closed. And, and then I started getting involved as soon as I finished graduate work, and I started getting involved here at the university, and the best thing that happened with regards to that is I had a chance to meet Dr. Hale and Dr. Alder uh, and learn from them about um, what makes a good international program. And I have the least sexiest job out of everyone here in that I teach people about anatomy. Now, I don't think it's, I think it's a fantastic thing, but hearing all the wonderful things that, um, that uh, Dr. DeVries and Dr. Price and everyone here is doing with regards to surgery. I, I went to Ghana for the first time with Dr. Alder and, and Dr. Hale, and I just wanted to go meet their anatomists and see, is there anything that I could do? And it was an amazing trip in 2005, which sparked a, a fantastic working relationship that I have with them. And I just like this picture because there's Dr. Hale about 150 feet off the ground walking across a rope bridge. And he does a lot of things as an old guy. He is amazing at all the stuff that he does. So in 2005, um, I had a chance to go over to Ghana. And I, I said, all, I just went to just meet their anatomists and to see what things were like there and, and if there's anything that we could do to collaborate together. So uh, KNUST is in Kumasi, Ghana, in West Africa. And when I went there, I had a chance to meet Dr. Abedu. And I had to be sitting because every time they took a picture, they chopped my head off. And so I'm sitting to meet with Dr. Abedu, and she's this department chair, and just a delightful individual. And uh, while we are there, um, she showed me around. And, and this is probably nothing different than many of you have experienced going to your, meet your counterpart at some institution or place around the world. She said, hey, let's take a look at our lab. So she brought me to the histology lab. And in the histology lab, they had 150 microscopes for their 150 students. Only 44 of them worked. And she showed me all these parts that just weren't working. She says, so we just we have a really tough time. Our glass slides keep breaking. We can't get parts for our microscopes. Um, and so I took pictures of everything to say, hey, maybe there's something we could do to help you find parts and to get it because it's hard to order things. And yeah, those microscopes were used back in the day when Hippocrates was still doing things. So they're really old, and we, it was hard. We couldn't find anything for them. So next, she brought me into the cadaver lab. Don't worry, I won't show you pictures of the cadaver lab. But brought me in and showed me the cadaver lab. Fantastic. Um, lab, they had uh, a number of cadavers, they have a very good body donor program, and so they had a lot of these cadavers and showed me around, fantastic, very similar to how uh, people in Europe and North America do anatomy. And then she said, as a side note, after passing the library, hey, do you want to see our computer lab? I said, I would love to see the computer lab. So she went, and we went and talked to a librarian who found a key, who then, we walked down the hall and opened the door, and we went inside, and there was 25 brand new, this is again 2005, but at the time, brand new computers running Windows XP donated from the Gates Foundation. I said, this is fantastic. So what do you do with these? And she says, well, I don't do anything with them. Some of the students check their email on them, and um, that they're really here. And I, and I said, well, is there any, what plans do they have to do? And she says, I'm not sure what we're going to do with them yet. And so that that sparks something in the back of my mind, because I love some of the things I do is try to find ways technology can help in education. So when I finished this two-week trip, and it was fantastic, um, some of the things learned was, well, one thing, you know, uh, Kumasi's under the British medical system. People leave secondary school, go right into medical school, and they have three preclinical and then three clerkship years, and they're done med school. They had 144 students at that point per school, uh, uh, per class, and they had one and I said one and a half anatomists to teach all these students. I say one and a half because um, the one professor was only 50% time, and he passed away a year and a half later, and it's really been Dr. Abedou who teaches all three years, so basically you're looking at close to 450 medical students that she does alone. 
and, and they don't have internet. Well, they didn't have intranet. They kind of had internet, but it was, it was running a little on the slow side. And uh, they had all these brand new computers, and she says, yeah, I'd be very interested in collaboration. So that was in the summertime, so the following January we came back, and I brought a colleague of mine. So those of you who, have been, who are here know Dr. Stenses, she's been teaching here for quite a while. And Dr. Stenses teaches neuroanatomy, and she says, I'll come with you. I love doing this stuff. So she came over, and we said to this Dr. Abidu, what can we do? Anything to help. So Dr. Abidu said, you know what? The biggest thing I need is we do small group learning. And we do both neuroanatomy and osteology labs. Can you do our first and second year student small groups? We're like, happy to. We do 10 groups, and they have, an, they have 10 people per group, and it's an hour each. 14 hours, once through. Okay, so we said, giddy up. So we went inside, and we grabbed bones and for one lab, and, there's, and brains for the other one to help Dr. Ruby do. And we basically saved her three days, or she could be doing something else. And Dr. Senses and I went, and we taught students. Had a fantastic time. But that's a lot of teaching. For 14 hours, approximately, all the way through these students to do this one group. And we thought, well, okay. Uh, it was a lot of fun, fun teaching. There's got to be a better way we could, that, that could be done with that. Lecture hall. She says, hey, can you help out some lecturing? We'd be happy to. We did some lecturing. So we'd go, and, and it would be lecturing some students. So whatever topic Dr. Ruby wanted us to go on. And something that I noticed when we were there is that you could tell the students who had money and those students who came from families who did not. Those who had money brought the brand new, shrink-wrapped, plastic, brand new textbook of anatomy. Or the students who didn't, which came with a, a blank notebook. And they sat down. And so there's this big discrepancy, even from students there, about what they were bringing to lecture class. Again, these are brand new med students, in a sense, out of secondary school, and we had them their first and second year. So something that we learned on this first trip, well, something that we then discussed with Dr. Abidu, could technology help reduce the amount of student-teacher contact hours that were going on? Could we maybe do something with technology to help with this? And what if we could use computer tutorials to help augment the amount of time it took for small group learning. And so we demonstrated some of the computer-assisted learning tools, tools we've been using at the University of Utah that we created. That we just said, hey, we're happy to share with you however you'd like to use it. And so we demoed some of them. And she said, we'd love to see more of that. So next time we came, and this is for Dr. Harris because it said, didn't he say this makes him nauseous to use this one? So we all heard this expression. If you, give him, if, you, if you feed a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man a fish, right? You, Feed them for a lifetime. But you want to ask yourself some questions for fish or technology. One, does they, do they have fish? If they don't have any fish, why teach them to fish? And then if they have fish, do they like fish? If they don't like fish, don't teach them to fish because they're not going to eat them. And if they do like fish and they do like to fish, does anyone else in the community like fish? So it's the same thing for technology. We've got to ask, do they have technology? Do the faculty want technology? And do the students want this technology? Those are three things we asked ourselves when we were working with Dr. Abby Dew. So the first thing that I did is I brought another colleague of mine with me, Dr. Foreman, who knows far more about technology than I do. I'm, I'm the geek wannabe. He's the geek. So I brought him along, and, we, and so we came. And the first question is, do they have computers to use? Well, they had in the lab. But we had to find out what else do they have. They had these 25 computers for three years of you know, close to 450 med students. What about the students? So that was something we had to ask. We, doctor, we talked to Dr. Abidu. Do the faculty have computers? How much do they want to do? And she says, in preparation for you coming on your next trip, we hired someone to run the computer labs. So now someone is in there all during the day running the computer labs and helping students to get access and to help the faculty. So knowing that we are going to come to work on technology, they already put the infrastructure in place. This. Uh, act that they had with hiring Do uh, Charles Doncor was one of the biggest things that helped with our working because they now have someone dedicated in helping with technology for faculty and students. Now, do the students want computers? Now, I, I, this seems really dumb because I know this is 2011, and especially after Dr. Harris talked about 4,000% increase, this is back when we went in 2006. And so it doesn't seem like that long ago, but back then it was, we, we, I just didn't know. Uh, what the students. So we did an IRB approved needs assessment, went through their IRB office, and went through uh, uh, 225 students between first and fourth years, uh, some in the clerkship years, and a handful of residents, and found that 
and I'm not going to bore you with the stats because I think you can guess what the, the, the conclusions is. Yeah, they really like computers and they wanted more of it. As a matter of fact, they said we prefer things on computers. The faculty didn't want it. And you know what? Africa is no different than the United States. I started in 1999 as a graduate student. We didn't have a website for anatomy. It's really not that long ago. There's no website. So I came on board and I'm like, why don't we make a website? Fantastic. So I made our first website. It was really hokey, but it got better through the years. And now you come and everyone expects it. Younger, the, the, the kind of junior people, those who were like ignorance on fire, come on board. We have an idea. We need the wisdom of our years to help direct us. Ghana is no different. All these up-and-coming students, the young faculty, want technology. And they know how to use technology. They need those who have the years to help them to know how to use the technology. So we then brought some of our tutorials and said, how about we install them on the computers and, and give some examples of how they could be used. And so what we did is we started with one, one of them. I'm just going to show you our digital dissector. Now, the reason I want to just take two seconds and talk about how we created this tutorial is that we always created it with the end in mind that it could be used by any faculty around the world to then, they could use this software to, for their courses. So what we did is we took all the different regions of the body, we took pictures of cadavers and sequence of dissections and put them in this tutorial so you could walk through and say, I want to dissect the neck, I want to dissect the mediastinum, I want to dissect the posterior thigh. And it walks them through. And what we did is we took pictures and we stick them in a folder and using a program called Adobe uh, Flash can link text and photographs together. So in this, what we show is there is a first, there's a picture of the abdominal cavity of small intestines and mesentery. We have associated text that goes along with it. And then we have controls at the bottom that help students like go through to the next picture. They can zoom in and they can rotate the picture and so forth. Now, there's also ways that there's info at the bottom that you can click and read about more information. Now, cool, boy, that's really unique, isn't it? In again, the year 2012. But back in 2003 when we created this thing, it was kind of novel at the time. But we created it not just for our students, but we created it for any faculty around the world who could use it. So way that we created it is if you take pictures and you put them in a folder, and those pictures are the things that appear on the left-hand side of this tutorial. Then our text box, what we did, is that you put some text in with a little bit of programming that they actually fill in the blanks. That's the text that appears on the right-hand side. And so as long as they can take a picture and they can add text to a text file, they can add anything they wanted to this thing. And so we explained this to Dr. Ebby Dew and said, here's what we started with. What can we do to help cater this to your curriculum so you don't have to take the University of Utah and make it your curriculum? So we installed these on the computers and helped train Charles Doncourt, the computer lab technician, and Dr. Abedou and some other faculty. And then we walked through all the tutorials with the students and let them go to work. And so what we found over the past few years is that the students started installing these on their own computers. Now these students are, they, they would lug their hard drive across campus to bring their hard drive and install the programs and bring it back because we didn't have an intranet. They're bringing their laptop. They're bringing these external hard drives and installing them so they could have them. And other departments started saying, we want this. And so ophthalmology, physiology, pathology, some of the other uh, allied health uh, sciences on campus started incorporating these as well. Then the Kofinoche Teaching Hospital, for some of their clerkships, wanted these programs. So we helped to install them for them as well. And Dr. Foreman was invited back. And so for all nursing training programs over the nation of Ghana, there was how many? 37 locations overall, 338 computers. He installed it on theirs. Well, you can understand why one of the big uh, emphasis we've had in our recent visits is to get a stronger internet connection for obvious reasons. To, to This would take all of that out of the picture. But you do what you have to with what uh, resources are available. Now, currently, this is a, I just want to talk about now what's happening, is that Charles now has installed, because they have an internet site on campus that's wired internet that they can use uh, at the KNUST, and they, have, they no longer have this high demand in the labs. It got to the point that students would be waiting in line, and they'd have rules that you can only be on the computers for 30 minutes because of how many students were using the computers for anatomy and pathology and neuroanatomy and histology programs we brought. 
another thing is that now anyone in Ghana at Can You See can make their own tutorial. So one of the things Dr. Ebidu did recently, last summer, is hired a student to help take our histology pictures and all the histology pictures they use in their program and to populate this tutorial. So now they're taking images that we have that, hey, simple squamous epithelium is simple squamous epithelium. But they've also had their library of pictures that they've got a microscope and they take their own pictures. They're populating and making the curriculum their own. Um, da -da. And this, I won't read through this whole thing, uh, but one of the things that this is a correspondence I had with Charles this past year is that he said, now we're doing it at the CAF. Uh, they're, they're installing, uh, they're getting, they have a fantastic internet connection at the CAF. We're doing more of the programs. Um, he's got a paper he's working on right now, the use of, of IT by students of health sciences at, the, at KNUST and CAF that uh, he's working on getting a grant. He's trying to get a biomedical informatics uh, program going at the, at the medical school right now, and he's working with the vice chancellor to help establish an informatics program. Um, Dr. Abedou, she is someone that I've, I, I mean, what she accomplishes amazes me. The thing, I, I'd say, the biggest thing I've learned about my work in Ghana is that these individuals, they, um, they're bright. They're, they're, you know, you think of anyone in academia, these are very bright individuals. We have nothing on the smart monopoly in the world. These people are very bright. They just lack many times as resources. So help Dr. Ebidu, he teaches 35 hours per week. That doesn't include grading and so forth, of helping her now take some of the teaching responsibility and use technology. Um, uh, a couple of other things. We have a paper that we're working on together that hopefully will be uh, accepted and published this year and that uh, we have a goal to help uh, have her attend some anatomy conferences to learn how technology is being used in North America and Europe in medical education. I mention this because any of the work that I hope to accomplish that would be positive is all because Dr. Abbe Du and I have a good collaboratory working environment. We talk, we get to go back and forth on ideas, and that's why. She's there 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year, she's always there. And I'm only there a few weeks out of the year. And so she's the one that you, I, I've been able to find someone who's interested in collaboration, and we work together, and that's why any success we've had is because of her. Um, a couple of things as a result of that, now we can do some collaboration with people in Accra and Hainan, China. I went once. Um, I, I'd love to do more, but as those of you know who do international work, it's very easy to spread yourself thin. But one of the things that I found out recently is this tutorial we have, they've completely now converted it in both English and in Chinese. So they have the entire tutorial, so there's something like 2,700 anatomical terms that are throughout this tutorial, and the whole thing now is in English and in Chinese, so that they're not only lo learning anatomy, they're also learning English, which is something they try very hard to do um, at the medical college as well. So a couple of things for future work we want to do. So in conclusion, those are always nice words, aren't they, in a presentation, uh, is uh, the American Association of Anatomists is our main society here. They have the West African Anatomy Association, and one of the goals that we're trying to do in the next five years is to have um, a collaborative meeting in, in somewhere in West Africa where we have anatomists from our society meet with anatomists from their society and present on, on education and technology. They have a new PhD training program that I was just invited to be uh, um, an adjunct professor to help with their graduate students. And um, yeah, and Dr. Stensis and I are working with them on establishing a neuroanatomy course. Um, I, none of this could be done without Dr. Ebigen Yega and Dr. Ebedu, Drs. Foreman and Stensis and Drs. Alder and Hale. Thank you very much. <laughs>